Uh, but happy belated Earth Day and happy Arbor Day. And so earlier this week, many of you, I know we have many uh, elected officials here from Chesterfield County. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we celebrated Arbor Day uh, with the Lego Group earlier this week, planting 1,400 trees to replace those that were cleared for the 1.7 million square foot facility. Uh, and sustainability was a driving factor for the Lego Group and their decision here. And according to a 2023 survey of top site selection consultants, environmental regulations in a community ranked number three, which is up from number nine in 2022. Just last month, USA Today ranked Richmond the number one most climate resilient city in the nation, which is absolutely fantastic. This means that our region is at lower risk of facing environmental disasters and it helps draw companies to our region thanks to our environmental stability and the reliable and affordable power that we have from Dominion Energy. This is also why many, many data centers are attracted to our community. So joining us today are Bill Graff, Senior Vice President of Farm Deployment from Plenty Unlimited. Bill, thank you for being here. Elizabeth Habas, Manager of Climate Change and Sustainability Services with EY. Molly Parker, Vice President of Environmental and Sustainable Sustainability with Dominion Energy. Marshall Weekly, uh, Central Virginia Client Solutions Manager with Horrigan, and Jay Wilson, Vice President of Sustainability from JLL. So thank you all for joining us here this morning. We will ask our guests to hold your questions toward the end of the discussion. And so right now I wanna share that the building that we're in here is the building that we live in, one floor up. It is a LEED Gold certified building. And so if you've visited our offices or if you're here today drinking the water, you will see the recycled bottles from Hanover-based Virginia Artesian. And that's just one way that GRB, GRP embraces sustainability. We have a great story to tell here related to sustainability, but rather than hear it from me, we have these great experts here. And so to start, off, to start us off for each of you, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how sustainability is involved with your business? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, um, sustainability has always been a part of my background. I'm an architect. Um, I was director of sustainability for a firm that focused on affordable housing and uh, worked for the city in Washington, D.C., uh, starting the Green Bank and working on green building policy. So, trying to figure out how do we be impactful at scale. And then with JLL, kind of was a different opportunity to focus on that scale. So working with private sector partners and corporations that are really focused on how do they achieve their net zero goals, um, we have a great opportunity with JLL to help them figure out kind of how do they be innovators in the industry and kind of set that bar. So instead of on the regulatory side, raising the bottom for all players, um, who's kind of at the leading edge and what kind of examples can we set for the, um, for the industry as a whole? So that's sort of uh, what I do day in, day out is ESG strategy and decarbonization strategy for those folks to figure out, you know, how do they achieve those ambitions? Great, thanks. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Elizabeth. Um, just wanna first of all thank uh, the Greater Richmond Partnership for the invitation, great to be here. Um, so I've been in the sustainability realm for over 10 years at this stage. Um, currently I'm with EY. Many of you may think of EY as a public accounting firm, of course, which we are. Um, but I'm a member of uh, a dedicated group of advisors called um, CCAS, Climate Change and Sustainability Services. We're a group of 300 folks uh, within the U.S., 3,000 globally, who advise, work with companies on all sorts of sustainability things. Um, we essentially meet companies where they are and help them get to the next realm. Anything from circular economy strategy, where I spend a lot of my time, um, to regulatory preparation, getting ready for uh, European regulation, um, as well as how to get ready for some of the SEC rulings that are happening here in the U.S. Um, so really delighted to be here today and share a little bit about what we're hearing in the, the corporate business space um, as it comes to sustainability. So thank you. Awesome. Well, for those who I uh, don't know in the audience, Marshall Weekly, Client Solutions Manager with Horgan. We're a uh, regional construction management development company headquartered here in Richmond for the last three decades. We've been lucky enough to be involved in some marquee key sustainable projects throughout our uh, region, one of them being the Dominion Energy's headquarters building next door, as well as most recently the uh, Solega project, which will definitely get started here, uh, here before too long. And from a personal front, with a uh, background and degree in environmental design and spending the last decade at Horrigan, where my current focus is really on business development, early project engagement, and really kind of helping projects come to fruition. It's almost a prerequisite 
to have a deep understanding of sustainability in larger scale commercial construction and development industry these days. And I'm really glad that we pulled together this panel um, because it's it's in almost every single large scale job that's happening in Richmond these days. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Molly Parker, um, Vice President of Environmental and Sustainability for Dominion. It's really great to see everyone this morning, and and thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so I've been with Dominion now for about 17 years, but um, kind of my journey with environmental and sustainability also kind of started out as a young, as a kind of a, a young woman, and I uh, went to Virginia Tech in and um, got my degree in the environmental and uh, policy field. So um, after tech joined Dominion and have had the opportunity to have a, a number of different roles with the company, uh, see a, a lot of different sides of the business. So worked in policy, uh, worked in our alternative energy uh, team that was really responsible for like the initial conceptual um, design behind our offshore wind program, which it's really amazing to see that that, that project is uh, starting construction now. So um, from there, I worked on federal energy policy, and then I've been with our environmental team now for about five years. And I uh, just took this role about nine months ago, and it's a, a great team that I'm honored to lead. We have about 125 environmental and sustainability professionals um, that work in my office. So, um, you know, I've been very passionate about sustainability and Dominion sustainability strategy. Um, you know, our mission is to provide reliable, affordable, and increasingly clean power. And so, um, just very honored to to help the company do that. So, great to see everyone this morning. Right, thank you. Morning, everyone. Bill Graff with Plenty. Uh, my job is the SVP of deployment. I help with the design, construct, install of our farms. Um, and you know, I come from a 20-year uh, background of uh, being in the engineering and construction field. Uh, done a lot of food and beverage manufacturing. Seen how food is made. Uh, I, I went over to Plenty because it's uh, I believe in the mission that we can make uh, food a lot more sustainable uh, in a clean way. Uh, we kind of have three pillars at Plenty. You know, we want to reduce the footprint of, of farming uh, and provide great product. Uh, we want to be able to electrify everything because then we can control that the best possible. And then we're, you know, we want to partner with great partners like Dominion to obtain cleaner energy as we go along. We can control the first two, and part of that is decreasing our footprint. And just to put it in perspective, you know, the, the farms we're building, uh, the land usage, you know, one farm, uh, if you look at a soccer field as an agri outdoor agricultural, we're doing the same amount of food in the goalposts, you know, year round. So that's fantastic. And then we're, you know, 80 to 90% less water usage. So we'll save about 80 Olympic sized swimming pools this year of water once we get running to full speed. So sustainability is really important uh, to get that fresh produce to the, to the customer. Awesome. Thank you each. Uh, Elizabeth, can you describe the overall regulatory environment when it comes to sustainability? And then how does risk mitigation play into your role? Sure. So thank you for that question. I would say risk mitigation and regulatory when you're working in the corporate sustainability space for a consultant, that's about 80% of what I'm doing with my clients right now. Um, one exciting thing about sustainability is it's always changing and evolving and growing both in the private sector as well as the regulatory sector. Um, so we're seeing a lot of new regulation come out globally um, that's really setting the bar in a different place for companies to have to, to meet. Um, so a lot of where the regulatory space is now is coming out of Europe. Um, there's a fairly large directive that came out of the European Union called the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. This is the ABC's of sustainability. It's really fun. Um, so the CSRD is completely fundamentally changing how companies are disclosing their ESG data um, in the public realm. Um, and it's really expanding the breadth and depth of what they're required to report. Um, so a lot the, um, the disclosure against the CSRD is tiered. So a lot of companies, especially those headquartered in the US that do a certain amount of business in the EU are gonna be scoped into this type of regulation. So they won't have to disclose there for a number of years, but we're helping them get ready now because it's gonna take a couple of years to get ready. That's how big it is. 
Um, within the U.S., we're certainly seeing some movement as well. Um, the SEC has recently issued a climate rule um, that is currently in the courts and going through that process. But um, a, a key theme of U.S. regulation is uh, assessing climate risk as well as carbon emissions and disclosing um, some of those um, items for your for your business. We're also seeing some state level regulations happen as well. Uh, there's some new regulation coming out of California that again is focused on uh, carbon emissions as well as climate risk. Um, so the regulatory space is changing. Um, it also depends on where you do business, the amount of business you do in certain markets, um, but it really is becoming so much more robust. Um, and even if your company isn't in one of those places, if you are doing a certain amount of business in those regions, you may be scoped in. If you're a growing company and you happen to get acquired by a company that's global that does business, you could also potentially be scoped in. So I don't say that to, to scare folks about regulation. I think regulation is a really exciting opportunity to expand um, and understand your impact and kind of adjust your strategy to that. Um, but it, it is becoming more of the norm and the business as usual. So I think it's really important for companies to get ready and understand um, where that sustainability area might impact them. Um, and then just briefly to your second question, the risk piece, I think, is the key driver of a lot of this. Um, you know, risk mitigation is kind of the, the the main kind of driver of responding to a lot of these regulatory um, issues. So whether or not you, um, you know, see or able to invest in certain areas or others within the ESG realm, from a risk mitigation perspective, really you're that's kind of driving a lot of these decisions because if you don't, there's a risk of um, you know non-compliance with regulation or uh, there's a risk of, of uh, greenwashing you know claims or something like that. So we often work a lot with our corporate clients on looking at sustainability from a risk perspective because there is risk embedded um, whether you do one thing or the other, and it's a really important um, driver of business decisions around ESG work. So um, that, that, again, that's a, a big part of what I do day to day, and a lot of the companies that I work with, the questions they're asking are specifically about risk and regulation. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bill, you've hit on this a little bit, but how could you tell me, how are Plenty's operations more sustainable than traditional farming methods? Secondly, how did sustainability impact Plenty's site selection process? And third, just how many Driscoll strawberries will the farm yield? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we hit you know, up about the first little bit, you know, uh, so we, we can control our footprint you know, uh, our water usage and our uh, land usage. Uh, so I kind of gave you some statistics there, you know, 350 times more than the outdoor agricultural uh, per acre uh, pr productivity. So that's fantastic. Um, the other part though is there's also supply chain element. You know, we're going to be growing strawberries within one day's drive of, of 100 million people. So that kind of led to why Richmond? You know, first, why not Richmond? It's, fant it's been a fantastic experience. Uh, we need reliable power, Dominion. Uh, affordable power, Dominion, thank you. Um, so that all came together for us uh, and being closer. And then, you know, with that supply chain, we're also cutting down uh, strawberries being shipped from Mexico, California, three days drive in a truck. Now it's a lot closer to the consumer. Um, and also the food waste, now the strawberries in a store the day later after we pick it and uh, last longer on the cu customer uh, refrigerator. <laughs> so you're not having that food waste. So those are all reasons, you know, why Richmond, you know, and we hope to continue to grow more. This first farm uh, that we're building now will be 4 million uh, pounds of strawberries a year coming out of that farm. Awesome. Thank you. Elizabeth and Jay, both of your organizations work with clients around the nation and around the world. What kind of green goals are your clients working toward? And then how do you help them reach each of those goals? Sure. Thanks. Um, so, you know, increasingly our clients are focused on net zero carbon goals and attainment. And I think, you know, where our focus is, is developing the ESG strategy and decarbonization strategy for those organizations. 40% of global emissions are real estate. And so as a real estate firm, we have a great opportunity to kind of get in there and not only develop the strategy, but make that tangible and implementable for our clients. So we kind of work through the full end-to-end -end life cycle of real estate uh, with those decisions. So from early site selection, where we help a company understand the impact of their decision and, and where to locate, um, through kind of fitting out those spaces or those buildings, attracting tenants and making sure that um, 
disclosure of uh, utility information is transparent and shared by both parties. So through green leasing and sustainable transaction management uh, mechanisms. And then, you know, what is the fit out specifically? Um, can we help them manage embodied carbon uh, impact from those fit outs and prioritize clean energy and energy efficiency in those renovations? Um, for a lot of our clients, you know, uh, JLL's focus is also to achieve net zero uh, emissions by 2040. And for us, that includes all of our scope three emissions. So 95% of our emissions are those emitted by our clients. So the energy that our clients use in their uh, buildings. So by helping them achieve their goals, we're also achieving our goals. And we're deeply investing in sustainability and have grown our team 300% in the last two years um, to help them meet those and achieve those goals. Um, so our the companies that um, I have the pleasure of working with and my team, um, goals really range um, depending on, on the industry. Of course, we've seen a lot of um, incredible goals being set um, and strategy oriented towards carbon emissions, net zero. Um, that is also expanding to the social realm. So um, community investment, um, you know, employee well-being, work-life balance, things like that. Um, and then on the governance side as well, um, just, you know, greater diversity and, and board representation, leadership, things like that. I would say what's really driving a lot of the goal setting now is within this realm of regulation. Um, as companies are going to have to disclose more and more ESG data, um, they're really kind of taking a step back and saying, okay, what, how are these disclosures going to impact the goals I've already set? And is there any opportunity to, to shift? So I think that's what a lot of companies are going through now and, and really thinking, um, I work a lot with the uh, with the consumer segment, so um, things you buy at the store, uh, the drugstore, the grocery store. Um, so I get particularly personally excited about some of the goals happening within the material sector. I'm sure there's a lot of um, exciting work happening in, in building and construction materials in the consumer space. Um, we're working with a lot of clients on uh, materials for their packaging, as an example. Um, is there more recycled plastic that we can bring into recycled packaging? Um, is there are there, um, you know, what's the market for recycled plastic? How do we increase that? It's really kind of an ecosystem wide goal that has to be set and you have to really work with uh, your competitors, um, you know, to kind of, to, you know, uh, Im improve overall sustainability of products. So we're really seeing um, a lot of goals being set across the board. Um, and I think that's gonna continue to increase and evolve as companies get ready for some of these um, public disclosures. For them. Right. Marshall, can you tell me a little bit about some of the projects that are underway in the region uh, that are using sustainable building materials and how is Oregon helping companies achieve their goals? So I'll just say from Richmond's perspective on the design and construction side, we're really fortunate to have some large scale corporate users like Dominion Energy, VCU, Capital One that have been building sustainable buildings for decades. Um, and once you add in Lego and the CoStar project going on. Most every single large scale project currently underway in Richmond is highly sustainable. Um, and it's really setting the bar for not only all of these larger Fortune 500 companies projects, but the uh, smaller private or developer speculative led, um, led projects in our region as well. And a lot of it is driven by those developers not solely doing it because it's the right thing to do or just to get a plaque on the wall, but it also makes sense financially. And I'm sure Jay can get into some of this too. It's the more sustainable higher end class A product is going to demand a higher rent premium. A lot of tenants are requiring a certain level of lead certification in their spaces, which I'm sure GRP is seeing in a lot of the requests that you all get. Um, as well as just uh, increased employee retention, um, employee satisfaction, um, and overall happiness and indoor air quality and numerous things like that. Um, so again, it's it's not only the right thing to do, but it makes sense financially, even from private developer going in and, and building a product. Uh, back to like some specific projects, uh, Lego job, and it's, I know it's five certifications there going for, but it's lead gold, lead zero energy, lead zero water, lead zero carbon, and well platinum. Uh, and for those that don't know the well certification, but well is more focused on the building occupant themselves, whereas lead is focused on the 
more of the design and construction elements and not as much on performance um, and really the long-term um, building occupants that are going to be in the facility. And Lego is also using, uh, you mentioned building materials earlier. Um, their office portion is going to be completely made out of mass timber. So that'll include glue laying columns and beams and cross laminated timber panels, which for those that haven't been involved in that, it's basically an alternative structural system to concrete and scale and, um, and steel using uh, basically binding together smaller pieces of, uh, of wood to create a uh, larger panel. I mean, essentially picture plywood on steroids where rather than <laughs> three quarters inches thick by um, four by eight, it's eight to 10 inches thick and 10 feet wide by 25 feet long. Uh, and so back to the zero carbon side of things um, and why this is such a interesting new trend in art industry is that basically as as forests grow, they sequester carbon from the atmosphere indefinitely. And then as the trees mature, their ability to uptake carbon actually diminishes. So basically you're coming in, um, harvesting the trees, replanting them in a sustainable fashion, uh, and you're actually storing that carbon indefinitely in the built environment versus adding carbon to the atmosphere through traditional steel and concrete construction. On sunscreen, thank you. And I appreciate you breaking that down. Uh, I tried to supply <laughs> it a little bit. <laughs> when we had our prep call, there were so many yeah. words and I'm like, I have Rothy's on uh, a recyclable water bottle, but my knowledge is about this deep. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Molly, you got some good props from Bill there uh, talking mm -hmm. about Thanks, like, Bill. how amazing uh -huh. Jermaine is. But Companies uh, like Bill, like Plenty rely, require reliable power and lots of it. Uh, so talk to us about Dominion's green goals and how the company generates sustainable and affordable power for its clients. Sure, thank you. So um, I think we've been talking a lot about net zero. Um, Dominion several years ago established our uh, net zero by 2050 goal as well. And that also includes both um, scopes one, so our direct emissions, uh, scopes two from energy we purchase outside of our service territory, and scope three, kind of the downstream emissions. So power um, that we purchase from the grid would be kind of in that scope three category. Um, so we have uh, this goal to get net zero by 2050, and I'm really proud of our progress that we've made um, really over the last you know decade or so. So if you look back uh, to 2005, we uh, produced uh, about 50% of our power from coal. Um, and today we're down to, to about 10% um, reliance on coal. So we've reduced our uh, carbon emissions by nearly 50% um, since, since 2005. So great progress to date. And you know, if you look at that, that was really mainly um, from kind of coal to gas conversions. That was really the first phase in that transition. Um, today, we're in the phase of really massive um, amounts of renewable energy and integrating renewables onto the grid. Um, so y'all are probably aware that we have the largest offshore wind farm in North America. Um, we had some of the equipment delivered uh, over the last month or so in Portsmouth, and we're actually going to be starting our offshore uh, construction in early May. So it's um, a, just such an exciting project. Um, on the solar side as well, we've seen a lot of really good progress. So uh, we have about nine gigawatts of solar that is either in service or under development. And just to kind of put that in terms that folks can understand, that is enough to power over two million homes um, at, at when the sun is shining, right? Um, and, and that really gets to to the next point, when, when it comes to reliability, we are seeing a significant increase in our uh, demand moving forward. Um, and you know, when the, when the sun isn't out and the uh, wind isn't blowing, we need to make sure that we can keep the lights on. So um, going forward, in order to get to net zero, uh, not only are we gonna need um, wind and solar, but we're also gonna need uh, advanced technologies to really get us, get us all the way there. So that might, uh, look like energy storage. We have a lot of really exciting 
energy storage projects that are underway. Um, small modular reactors um, are also a, a key focus of ours um, kind of over the longer term going forward. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to take a diverse set of different uh, types of energy. Uh, we need to make sure that that we have um, reliable power and, um, and and so we're we're very focused on that. Thank you. Jay, can you talk to us a little bit about how JLL is helping clients retrofit their spaces to become more sustainable? Certainly. Um, all of uh, so uh, all of the the buildings in our community are already existing, and that's where a those are the energy users. And if we need to achieve net zero carbon emissions, we need to retrofit those buildings, the existing building stock to make it more sustainable. Um, we are working with clients to retrofit their buildings and to also develop design and construction standards to help tenants and folks who are leasing those spaces develop new sustainable um, tenant improvement spaces um, as they occupy a new space. And so you know, there's a lot of different strategies um, when you're thinking about renovating a building um, that can improve the sustainability. So, you know, first and foremost, concentrating on kind of system integration and automation. So JLL has an arm of our company called JLL Technologies that also supports kind of property technology. So how do we monitor the energy use and use that information to continuously improve upon that performance? Um, it also helps with, you know, disclosure um, as is necessary for compliance with regulatory requirements. We are also looking at embodied carbon more and more in all of these spaces. So what are the scope three emissions? Um, the emissions that are part of the value chain of a building, but that we can't directly control. And how do we choose materials that help to um, have a positive impact on the ultimate kind of carbon emission profile of that project? So uh, things um, so, like uh, products that are come from closer to home uh, is the first thing. So we were working with a client trying to develop their design and construction standards, prioritizing those uh, products that are local to the community. Um, they have less carbon emissions because they have less uh, distance to travel. Also focused on things like um, recyclable materials in our carpets, in our finishes, um, and uh, products that kind of already have a sustainable life cycle to them, like lighting that is um, the LED lighting and things like that. So um, I would say buildings are getting more and more complex. And so really focusing on integrating those systems and thinking kind of big picture about how you make decisions early on in the process that have a lasting impact um, are a focus of a lot of our clients. Awesome. It's great. All right. So this next one, whoever would like to take it, but what can you talk to about, talk to me about what the impact on businesses is today? Uh, I'll jump in just yeah. mostly because it's Go. tied to uh, what Jay was talking about. I think the biggest thing from the construction and development standpoint is starting to track the embodied carbon. And it's not something historically that construction companies are used to doing. You're evaluating a material solely based on cost and quality. Um, and now trying to take into consideration the embodied carbon, where it's coming from, how it's getting there. Uh, so it's become very uh, documentation intensive, if you will, uh, on, on certain projects that are requiring some of those disclosures. Um, but it's just it's something new that um, we're having to kind of learn on the fly as regulations and different requirements change uh, change constantly but it's going to be uh, a bigger and bigger issue on the uh, on the construction side yeah I would say increasingly I mean acting on sustainability is a business decision so as Elizabeth was talking about earlier you know all of this speaks to managing risk and managing the long-term risk for an organization. So being able to understand kind of your energy profile and manage that over time to, you know, what are your exposures to um, physical climate risks? Um, and can you take action now, like even just raising your electrical room above the first floor if you're in a floodplain? Um, things that don't actually cost money up front 
but have long-term lasting effects and manage the exposure to those cost impacts over time. And so we're seeing more and more companies taking action now um, to prepare for kind of what that future looks like, um, especially on the compliance side as well. Um, understanding if in DC we have building performance standards, so a minimum energy requirement for existing buildings. So more and more companies are renovating their buildings to use less energy now so that they're prepared for when those regulations come into effect. So I think there's a lot of different um, impacts to the business community. One item I'll add to that that ties into both of your comments is data. And we we talk about time about data and AI and all of that, but within at least a lot of what our, our um, clients are talking about is, okay, data is essential to reporting on what you're what you're speaking to and measuring your energy. And a lot of what um, companies are, the business sector in general is understanding is, okay, what data do I need? Do I have that data? If I don't, where do I get it? And what is the infrastructure I can establish and the governance I can put in place to manage that data so that it accurately collects from the right um, location across the business? and makes reporting easier. Um, and I feel really excited about the um, role that AI can play in that. Um, and we're seeing that a lot. Imagine, I mean, the, those of you in the room that might be familiar with ChatGPT or a tool like that, where you can easily just use AI to kind of generate um, some insights that you need. Imagine being able to leverage a tool like that um, to help with your reporting um, or gather data that you need. Um, I mean, I think the, the the industry is really changing in a way that I think hopefully is gonna make it more efficient um, and less cost intensive in the future, but really wrapping your head around the type of data you need, I think is gonna be absolutely essential in the business world um, as ESG, not only from the regulatory standpoint, but the opportunity, the innovation standpoint as well is only gonna increase over time. All right, Elizabeth and Molly, how do you anticipate sustainability will impact relocation and expansion decisions in the future? Great question. So then go for it, start. I can, yeah, yeah okay. Um, it's a great question, and it gets back to the risk component. Um, so, um, you know, we're seeing weather patterns. They are what they are. Um, we're seeing hurricanes. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, dry spells. I mean, all sorts of things. And I think um, relocation is going to have a big uh, impact in terms of how businesses decide where they do their business um, and what risks are in place for doing business in a certain location. Um, I'm certainly seeing that from the regulatory perspective. I hate to always go back to regulation, but a big part of um, what this regulation is asking companies to assess is what is your risk as a business based on where you are, what you manufacture, your supply chain, et cetera. So the physical location where you actually do that work, um, there's a climate risk anywhere. Um, anywhere in the world, there's a climate risk. Um, and so just assessing the risk of one location over the other and how that impacts some of those business decisions. I think is going to be essential. Companies are doing it already, but they're going to be even uh, required to disclose on some of those climate risks publicly. So the public realm investors specifically are going to be looking to that. So I think relocation is going to have a huge impact as it relates to to climate risk over time. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think our customers, our regulators, all of our stakeholders, they're looking for um, increasingly clean energy. Um, so, you know, I think looking in, into the future, I, I, I don't see that changing. I see that um, really, you know, continuing to be, to be a focus. Um, you know, obviously as the electric provider, we play a, a very significant role um, in, in providing that um, sustainable pathway for a lot of our businesses that, that are locating here. Um, you know, Dominion not only has these, uh, these commitments going forward, but we, we recognize that a lot of the companies that are locating here also have those commitments. And so uh, we want to be a good a good business partner in helping um, businesses who are locating here really achieve their goals as well. And, you know, a lot of what you were saying rings true in terms of just, you know, looking for the, the importance of data. And uh, it's, it's very interesting just to think about AI. And um, as you were talking my uh, wheels were spinning, um, you know, from a kind of a risk standpoint as well, uh, a large part about what my team does on a day-to-day -day basis is bringing that data together so that we can uh, really provide that transparency to, to um, some of the different businesses that, that are located here. So uh, I'm excited for, for that yeah. potential to help in the future. All right, well, thank you very much to each of our panelists. <laughs>